Uh, welcome to Concordia University's Fourth Space, and thank you for joining us for today's event and the next episode in an ongoing series with the Iron Ring. And this one, it's discussing the world of biomedical engineering uh, with some advice uh, for a career in biomedical engineering. But to help situate you, today we are streaming to YouTube live from Forest Space, located at unceded Indigenous lands in Chichagi, Montreal. In Forest Space, we work with our university community to mobilize knowledge by co-creating daily activities that examine research questions across the university. We're running this as a hybrid event today on Zoom also. I noticed a couple people joining in by Zoom. So any comments or questions you have there, just uh, uh, put them in the chat or you could raise your hand and, we'll, and you could uh, mic on during a question period. Uh, so just let us know. Of course, anyone who comes into the space, can we all get microphones to them for questions also. Um, but with that, it's now my pleasure to hand it over to our hosts, Amelia, Alexandra, and Strabanti. Welcome. Thank you. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Iron Ring podcast. My name is Alexandra. I'll be one of your hosts today. I'm Amelia. And today we'll be discussing the world of the biomedical and engineering industry. And to talk a little bit about this industry, we have two guests here with us today, Soha Younes and Melanie Sevapalan. So thank you both for being here today. These two guests uh, are biomedical, are working in the biomedical engineering company, Boston Scientific. How are you guys today? Good, you? Good. <laughs> Good, thank you. So to get us started a bit, can you tell us a little bit about Boston Scientific? Yeah, of course. So, um, can you hear me well? Yeah. Yeah. Boston Scientific is a company that makes a med device. Um, they make med device for all sorts of uh, domains: um, cardio, cardiovascular, uh, electrophysiology, oncology, urology. You name it, right? Um, the Montreal site uh, started as a company called Criterion Medical, which was a startup. Um, that specializes in uh, atrial fibrillation, which is also known at, as the arrhythmia of the heart. Um, so uh, it started at Cartier, as Criterion Medical and it got acquired by Boston Scientific in 2018. So the Montreal site uh, works on the capital equipment for electrophysiology. And could you tell us a little bit about any projects that you guys are working on currently or one of the big projects that the, the company in Montreal works on? Yeah, so one of the main projects we work on is called Smart Freeze, and uh, it's basically cryoablation to treat atrial fibrillation. So for those that don't know, uh, atrial fibrillation is basically an arrhythmic heartbeat. Um, there's extra electrical signals that are being sent to the heart, and um, to treat that through cryoablation, it's basically freezing those nerves. And we have a new project, um, which I'll let Saha talk about um, so just to add a little bit, we started in Montreal. We had our R&D, production, quality, everything was in the Montreal site. Uh, when we got acquired, we, we became uh, only R&D. So now all new projects that are related to atrial fibrillation treatment come, come to the Montreal site. Um, uh, a new acquisition that Boston Scientific uh, recently uh, did was Farapulse. And they specialize in uh, PFA, which is pulse field um, uh, uh, ablations. So basically, instead of using a uh, high temperature uh, to freeze the tissue, they use uh, high voltage. I can't talk uh, more about it, but uh, <laughs> that's another project that we're working on right now. Well, it sounds very interesting, and we're excited to see where these projects come to and how mm -hmm. they develop in the future. Yeah, it's so from what we both, and you both studied here actually at uh, Concordia, mechanical engineering. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you both work now in the biomedical you know, industry. Why did you choose that field versus sticking to maybe something more traditional, mechanical? And was there anything necessarily that kind of pushed you guys to this field? So um, from my experience, I started as mechanical engineering uh, degree. I wanted to do aerospace, actually. So I, was, uh, I started in mechanical engineering and did a specialization in aerospace. Um, I did do, uh, so m one of my favorite classes at Concordia was thermodynamics. Oh. And it's with Dr. Kadam. Shout out to Dr. Kadam. <laughs> Kadam. Great teacher. Uh, yeah. So uh, I did a year of cardiovascular research with him in the lab. And it kind of uh, made me realize how passionate I was about biomedical. Um, and then I was lucky enough to uh, apply. So when I graduated, I applied to all sorts of engineering jobs, right? Like we all do when we, 
maybe you guys will realize <laughs> sure. when you graduate. Um, and I was lucky enough to get hired at Criterion, the startup, um, as my first job, and that's biomedical, and I've been loving it since. It's awesome. Uh, yeah, so a little different, but we kind of coincide a little. Um, when I was younger, I actually did robotics through high school in CGEP. And so that's kind of where my love for engineering started. Um, and so when I was applying for university, I applied to mechanical engineering uh, because of robotics. And uh, once I started, um, I, I wasn't really sure, to be honest. I was pretty lost in what I wanted to do. It was so broad and vast that I wasn't sure what I wanted to do at all. And come my last year, uh, I ended up doing my capstone with Dr. Kadem. Wow. And uh, yeah, so our project was basically uh, trying to simulate um, four different heart defects of for children um, in wow. the form of like a toy to explain to children what they're experiencing. Um, so that's kind of where I kind of touched into biomed and kind of got the understanding of how engineering can help in the health sector. And then when I was applying for jobs, um, as I said, you apply for anything and you take anything you can get kind of thing when you start out. Uh, I heard about this position um, and it was actually an internship. Um, so I was offered both an internship at this place and another company offered me a full-time position. And I really had to do my research on both companies and really understand what both companies did to like decide what I wanted to do. And it's an internship, right? So it's a little like scary, like, oh, I'm going into the field. Do I really want to start with an internship? But I really loved what this company was doing. I thought it was very interesting. And after my last year and doing Capstone, I was like, okay, I can really see myself in this field. So I took a chance and I took the internship and here I am four years later. <laughs> wow. <laughs> see, internships can get you a lot too. That's always a good yeah. thing, even you know, for students who I'm sure are kind of lost too, like I'm sure a ton of students are. I know even for, I'm sure all of us here too, you know, especially yours just starting. So yeah. I know it's a bit scary too, but for us, we, have been here for four years, and it's still daunting to kind of, you know, figure out what you want to do. So I guess with that being said, too, can you kind of describe, I know you kind of said the projects you guys do at the company, but with your specific roles, what do, what's your focus in like these types of projects, if you, if you can, of course, say everything, but are there specific focuses that you guys have, anything in particular that made you realize that, you know, even though you do love the biomedical field, maybe some stuff you like, some stuff you don't like, is there anything that kind of, I guess when you started your careers in this field that kind of stuck to you guys, what can you say about that? Um, so my role today in the company, I basically lead the mechanical engineering team. Okay. Um, I work on both projects that we mentioned before, so Smart Freeze and PFA. We work, uh, we, the mechanical team works on both projects. Um, so like what I really like about the medical field is you, you feel like you're contributing directly to, you know, improving uh, patient safety, like, uh, uh, you know, like the, in the, your, your impact is very direct because you're, you're saving lives. I know that sounds so cheesy, but, you know, it's, it's really nice. And, you know, at uh, Boston Scientific, we have an annual event where we meet the patients that, you know, our product helped. And it, it's the most rewarding event, honestly. Like, we, we all, we're all in tears when we're, you know, watching this event. So this is, this kind of validates that what I'm doing is, is contributing to the society. And I really, really love it. Um, one thing that is kind of maybe um, uh, people don't know that, but about the medical field, um, because it's very important that we don't make mistakes, there's a lot of documentation. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> so like in part of your job, 50% of it, of it is documentation and reading standards and, you know, getting familiar with the medical uh, med device standards and all that. So, uh, but at the same time, there's a lot of technical work, right? So it's kind of like a 50-50 from experience. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I, I definitely have to agree. Uh, I didn't really know what I was stepping into. Um, it was research and development, which I thought was really cool um, to be testing new things, testing new ideas, um, and really like, like, like she said, you have an impact directly and you see it, right? So you'll have technicians at hospitals and they'll give you direct feedback on something that you've changed or 
something that you're improving. And when you when you ha when you're that close to the system and you can really see how much it's benefiting a doctor because I because we added a feature or something like that, it's it's really exciting to see firsthand, you know. Uh, but like she said, there is a lot of red tape, um, <laughs> uh, which I think is great, right? Like it's med device. Like if ever I'm in that position, I really hope there's a lot of red tape, yeah. you know. Um, but you yeah, <laughs> so there's a lot of documentation. But I think uh, once you get past that and you get used to it, you get to look into a lot of really cool things. You know, it's. I feel like people with AFib is actually very common too, because I know even in my family, there's someone in my family, so it's cool that you guys are doing something that already directly relates to, you know, someone in my life, I know for a fact, so it could be that something changes in the future, you know, a lot of advancements in that sense is, that's, I think, super, super cool that at least you get to like try new things and like both projects sound very, very cool in my opinion, honestly, and I don't know, it's just, that's really cool. I love that you guys had that like experience where you get to actually see the results and kind of the experience with the people afterwards, because I feel like that's important, very important at least to be able to see like, oh, I actually helped someone, you know? That's awesome. It's yeah. different doing like the work behind the scenes and then not knowing exactly where it goes after. And then like, when, like you said, when you get to actually meet the patients that you help, that's, it makes, it gives you an, an, an extra push, I feel like. Totally, so it's really so, so motivational, you know. Um, even like day to day, sometimes it gets frustrating. Sometimes you can't get things in on time, and and your like day to day just sometimes can get very overwhelming. Yeah. And then it's just that one day that you talk to someone that's in the hospital that's seeing the product, and you're like, okay, now I get it. Now I get why I'm going through this sometimes. <laughs> I feel like you need that sometimes totally. to really be like, okay, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> Okay, so um, engineering in general has always been a lot more male dominated. So how would you guys describe the difference in gender diversity between the biomedical industry compared to other engineering disciplines? Um, very good question. <laughs> um, so I, I'd have to say that um, in biomed, um, you do see uh, more diversity um, in biomed um, compared to other engineering disciplines, and I've worked in aerospace and different fields, um, and you can really like see a noticeable difference, you know. Um, and I mean, I'll take a stab at why I think it is, but um, like there, there's a lot of stigma, as we know, as females in engineering, and. Uh, I feel like a lot of the time, like growing up, even for me, so I can talk about a personal experience. Um, Growing up, I wasn't even sure what engineering was. Yeah. I, 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 I didn't have a definition of it. I didn't know anything about engineering, you know? And my family is actually made up of a lot of doctors, a lot of people in, in health. And so growing up, I was like, okay, so I guess that's like my best option, you know? And even all, up until CGEP, I was torn between going into health or going into engineering. And it wasn't until like, my uncle sat me down and explained what engineering was to me. And he's like, you did robotics for three years and you're going to go into like biology. Like <laughs> he's like, yeah, make me understand that, you know? And it was until it wasn't until he like fully sat down and explained that to me um, for me to realize, oh, my God, I have an option. I have something that I'm very interested in and I can make a career out of it, you know? So um, I think that is a huge influence as to why you see possibly more females in uh, biomedical engineering versus other fields, you know? Um, and I think like if we start, or we have been starting uh, to like inform women more of what's out there. Um, and I think we need to continue and show them that um, these are options for them at, at a young age, you know? Would you say it's more welcoming? Uh, biomed yeah, versus biomed. others. Yeah. Um, hmm. <laughs> I think there's still long ways to go. Um, I, 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 it's nice to see that there's more females in biomed, but I, I think there's still a lot of, of work to get to a point where um, women do feel welcome. Mm -hmm. I think yeah, that seems it seems to be like a common denominator a lot of the time, but it. I, I feel like it builds a lot of character for us in a way. I'm sure for both of you, that's really like, it kind of made you realize what, how to, you know, act with certain people and, and whatnot. 
it's it's a tough industry even you know as students you still see that kind of uh divide sometimes but you know you make the best out of it i think totally. yeah but you are right like how it's like you feel like it's not as introduced to women as it is to men oh yeah because everyone thinks of engineering as a hands-on job and like when you think of hands-on you think of what construction like building things that's always like seen as a man's job Cars, yeah. yeah exactly yeah. Oh, yeah. so it is always seen as a man's job so it's true that it, we're not introduced to it as much mm -hmm. but i was going to go into bio also before university like i did health science at CGEP and i was like you know what this is the path, and then I realized it's just what, like, I'm not good at biology, so I was like, why am I going to go into health sciences? I'm not good at this. So, and I realized, you know, I'm good at math and physics, so I'm like, maybe that's what should be, like, talking in the back of my head, being like, this is the path, and I'm so glad that yeah. I chose this, honestly. I feel like it's, it would have been a really different career path had I done the other thing, and I think I would have not been happy in my Totally, my and, and that was the same case for me, right? So, like, I wasn't great at health, like chemistry. Oh god! <laughs> like, don't don't look my way. You know? yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, like, I I just didn't have the information that I think I needed, and I think it kind of needs to be advertised a little better because I don't think at that age, like, I'm I'm looking at seminars or I'm going to find it myself or I'm going to these events to like learn about my career or what options I have, you know, it's, it, it really needs to become more attractive uh, in a way, you know? Yeah, that's yeah. also one like great thing that women engineering are actually doing. It's like we have an outreach program where we go even to elementary schools yeah. to just teach them the definition of engineering and like, exactly. it's, it's great it's to so do that. It's so important, right? To yeah. start at such a young age. Yeah. Yeah. If not, that's, that's the thing, like, you know about it, but you don't actually know what it is. And even now, I don't think the definition is very clear. Yeah. You can't say that, like, engineering <laughs> is one thing, which is a whole other topic of conversation. But, like, because it's so broad, I guess, it can make it so that people are confused a lot. And that's why I think it's great that we have this outreach program where, you know, had I had someone maybe super young tell me, like, this is an option, and maybe I wouldn't have just been like, no, I'm gonna do health sciences only. But I'm also yeah. glad, you know, I did the experience. Like, I wouldn't have known had I not tried those classes, you know, but it happens to everybody. But what about you? Do you have any specific, you know, experience in that as well? Um, for me, it's like already, you know, you're born into the society where like the stereotypes are there, stigma's there. Yeah. So there's so many barriers that we need to work on, you know, reducing before like for for the for the next generation um when it comes to biomedical versus uh, other fields i do agree with mel like maybe the fact that it's some stem fields are more like um uh, like women are more encouraged to go into like health science and stem yeah. fields and all that so like this is kind of a good in between um but like I think Mel covered everything I wanted to say, but I do want to uh, make, uh, you know, just state something uh, cute that I think about <laughs> at the company sometimes, you know. Um, at Boston Scientific, if uh, most of the time, like, the there are more women uh, than other disciplines from what I from what I know, like asking my friends, because this is my first job, just to reiterate that. But like if I go to a meeting and it's only women, I always take a step back and, you know, have a smile on my face and have this like proud moment. And that happens a lot. It happens at least once a week at Boston Scientific, so just to kind of give you an idea of. That's Maybe nice. it is better in Boston Scientific, and they do they do try to to make it more diverse, and they have a lot of programs to encourage women to join the company and all that. So that's awesome. I think that's really big, at least like the promotion for both women and men, because I feel like that's again one of the biggest issues where it's like if you don't know about the company, then you won't you know know what they offer. And I think those types of incentives, kind of initiatives from you guys, is really it's really awesome for a company like that. At least my opinion. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, have either of you ever experienced the gender gap during either your career or your university studies? Yes, we experience <laughs> it every day. <laughs> We're not going to hide it, but I can give you a few examples, actually. Mm -hmm. Like, I think we all experienced where we went to an engineering class and we were one out of two women uh, yeah. in a class of 50. I mean, yeah. we, we do experience these things, right? Or, you know, you're with family and uh, you tell them you're doing engineering and they're like, wow, engineering for you? Oh, Why? Yeah. How come? <laughs> like, all these oh. small things that we don't really notice, like, they happen to us every day, right? Um, so, yeah, definitely. <laughs> we experience yeah. it all the time and, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, even in university, um, I remember 
very specific moment. Uh, it was a defining <laughs> moment. <laughs> I think every woman woman can go through has gone through this. Um, but I was doing mini cap, and I think we were picking teams, and that was one of the toughest days I think because we were, I think, in a class of maybe twenty twenty five. Um, we were like three women in the in the classroom, and I mean, I didn't know that many people in the class. So when we were picking teams, it was it, it was so hard for me to like for someone to even want to be like, hey, do you want to be on my team? You know, yeah. like um, I'd go up to a team and they'd already formed a team of five or something like that. You know, and um, I, I finally fell into a team. I like at first wasn't really given a chance to speak up or whatever and I really had to like push my way through and I, I felt like I had to prove myself to be able to be listened to you know um, so I think I, I think I, everyone experiences it at least once mm -hmm. in engineering specifically <laughs> yeah it's definitely expected for women to prove themselves even more oh, which is it's honestly a shame because it's like Constantly, you have to prove yourself. If you do something wrong, they'll probably take uh, they'll take it out more on you than they would on men. You know. Yeah, for sure. Also, like when they make a mistake, you're like, oh no, it's fine, it's fine. But when you make a mistake, it's like kind of defining. Like, mm. also, it's like ingrained in your brain too. Like, I also think I have to prove something to them, or that they're better than me, and then like I'm proved wrong, obviously, because as you should. <laughs> as you should. Um, you were actually telling me a really cool story about this and how women can kind of encourage, like encourage each other in the workplace. And I think that's a really good example for you to share. Yeah, I, I think there's ways for us to kind of participate in changing that. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a hard thing to do, but we should all try to participate. In my opinion, there's two ways to participate, whether it's a, on an individual level or a society level. So for example, I'm gonna give examples from my work. So as an individual like engineer at the company, um, the, I, let's say someone sent, I have an actual real example where a junior engineer sent an email and um, she's, a, she's a woman and uh, she made some mistakes in the email. So my natural reaction is to reply and, and correct the mistakes and state the facts and do all that, right? But uh, if we just stop for a second and take a step back and be aware of who is sending the email, you know, and try to be more kind. Um, what I tried to do in that situation is instead of replying to the email, knowing that there's so many people copied on it, right? Mm -hmm. I went to Teams, which is our platform where we chat, and I messaged the, that individ individual, and I basically stated the corrections, and I asked her, I gave her the opportunity, and I asked her, would you like to reply to your email and state those corrections yourself? Or now that you know that, you know, they need, the, these are like the facts. Do you want me to reply and um, state those things? So it, at least I kind of gave her the option to tell me uh, what she would like. I didn't want to embarrass her in front of everyone, right? So we have to realize that women do have to work twice as hard in these yeah. industries, right? And the, the easiest thing or the smallest thing we can do as women is to be an ally, right? Mm -hmm. So even in a meeting, let's say um, someone speaks over a woman, even if you don't know the person, right, you can basically stop that individual and say, hey, like, hey, John, um, good point, but I'd like to hear what Jennifer is saying, <laughs> for example, right? Like, small things like this we can do as individuals. So, and also on a societal um, level, for me, um, my role as a manager, I participate in the hiring uh, process, right? Mm -hmm. So we all know that, like, there's unconscious bias when people interview uh, men and women. You know, you can have two equally qualified candidates, um, and just because the, the, you know, like we always m tend to go with the men because in our mind, men are more qualified in engineering, which is very unfortunate. So what we can do is we can try to practice and exercise equity where we actually intentionally give the woman the opportunity because they're equally qualified versus giving it to the man because, you know, like sometimes this woman won't even get the chance to get interviewed because mm -hmm. of her name, right? Yeah. So that's, these are things that we can do to kind of help, you know, all these things. That's really nice. It's super nice that at least you went on, you messaged her on the side too because I feel like it is intimidating if you realize that you made that mistake and you sent it out to like a few people and it's a, it's great. I think it's a really, as a manager too, I'm sure it's for her, it must be like, she's giving me the opportunity to either speak up for myself or if she can correct me, she can, but 
you know, th that option I think is so important for a lot of people. And I think that that would help a lot of people, you know, maybe be able to give, cut themselves a bit of slack, you know? And I think that that's a big issue that we have trouble with sometimes. Cause like you said, you know, you make a mistake, you'll kind of hold it against yourself also, mm -hmm. even if it was a mistake that could have easily been done by your male counterpart, you know? Totally. But you'll be like, but I made this mistake and it just like sits in you. And then it's like a psychological thing, I think for us. Yeah, it's like the self-awareness that um, you, you don't want to feed into the stigma, yeah. you know? But um, it, it's in almost every decision that you make that you don't want to feed into the stigma. So that's so much harder, right? Yeah. Like, how do you think about it every second of every day to try and make that better, you know? So um, very cool. I thought that was a really great story that you were able to step back and think about that. Yeah. yeah, especially also since like it's a junior engineer, like even it's one thing being a woman in this field and then another thing also being just a junior or like a start, like starting off fresh, you know, so it's nice to give that opportunity, like no matter what. And it's a good lesson. Yeah. Yeah. Because it kind of like beats someone's self-esteem sometimes, <laughs> yeah. maybe if they get an email, like like a mass email. <laughs> yeah. It's scary. So, yeah. You made a typo. Yeah. <laughs> and and you'll, you'll be there too, right? Like I think we've both been in that position before where you're corrected in a mass email with a bunch of people CC'd, you know? Yeah. It's like you also have to deal with those punches as well, you know? Yeah, cause it's always normal that you, you're gonna make some sort of mistake, even if like like you said a typo. It's like it's mm -hmm. so normal, so it's nice that like it's clarified on the side, and then you could you could like prove it and like own up to your mistake and mm -hmm. and reply that way. Even the opportunity to own up to your mistake yeah. is is nice. It's different, you know. Yeah. Like, well, we don't have the fence already, like so. It's nice to be <laughs> you can do both. You can be like, listen, okay, I made the mistake, but it happens. Let's yeah. move on. Let's yeah. correct and move on. You know. So you kind of already answered this question, but what do you believe is necessary in elim eliminating this inequality in the field? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, th I think I touched on this a little bit before, but um, I, I think it starts when you're younger and being informed when you're younger, you know, um, for women specifically and young girls, you know. Um, and, and I know in our day and age, it's getting better and, and we're trying to, uh, make sure that our, our young girls are well informed before they um, go into the go into school or go into university and all those things, you know. But I think it starts even earlier than that, you know. It can start at the point where um, you give your young girls dolls and you give boys um, cars, you know, to play with, you know. When you grow up, you, you start questioning those things. As a young boy, you're playing with a car constantly and it's like, oh, like, how's this car built? How, you know what I mean? And yeah. you start questioning things that can possibly lead to, like, engineering questions, you know? Or um, Legos. Or Legos, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. And it, it's actually really cool to see. Like, I went into the Lego store recently, actually, and um, they're, like, catering to women more, you know? And, and it's, like, little, like, little girls in pink uh, Lego cubes and stuff like that to, like, really get like advertise to young girls as well which I think is so important you know and I think we really need to emphasize that and think about that consciously constantly when we're with family or friends or uh, like like just when we're around anyone we should be like thinking about these things you know it's funny the Legos I remember being a kid playing with Playmobil a lot and it was like the one toy that was always like the blue box all over the, and it was all, it was very much catered to male, like males yeah. in general. And I remember always telling my parents like, please, I want to, I want to like build something. And like, I would end up even with that, like I'd take the box of where the things would come from and like make things out of the box as well. So I'd be like using everything. And that's also why, I don't know why I didn't think about going into engineering, you know, young, but you didn't realize these things exactly. until afterwards. So that's why I think. That's such an important thing, which is again why women engineering is great, at least to introduce it super young. But the bias and already just our childhood is so like prevalent, and I think that's the biggest thing that maybe stop the future of it reaching this point. You know? Yeah, and I, like I, I mean, I don't blame like parents for it or anything no. like that yeah. either. I love playing with my Barbies, you know. <laughs> yeah. But like, get a convertible for your Barbie. Yes. <laughs> like, <laughs> things like that, you know. Like, you can still keep those cute traditions. Like, um, like I, I know my mom wanted to instill like Barbies and stuff in me. Like, she, she, she didn't have it as a kid, so it's cool that she was able to give that to me and stuff like that, you know. Uh, but just being aware, you know, being aware that hey, you know what? Let, let me make sure to have a good diversity in toys or whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
so like uh, Mal covered like the cultural societal factor, but I think it's really important for the industries to start creating programs that encourage women to join these positions. Um, I'll give you an example. Like um, I've started with this company since I was a junior engineer. Now I'm a manager. Basically, I'm the highest um, rank in our department, in mechanical engineering. So. One of my biggest fears today is, you know, I just got married this year, so what will happen mm. to the department when I go on maternity leave, for example, right? Mm. So I think the industry should try to help women, encourage them to kind of prepare programs for them, catered for them as leaders in the industry to be able to go on maternity leave and come back with, you know, not no one taking the role or department on fire or anything <laughs> like that, right? So um, now when we interview these days, we always keep in mind like, oh, like, if I want to hire this woman to be a leader, oh, what happens when she goes on maternity leave, right? Yeah, what yeah. happened to my company when she goes on maternity We should be asking ourselves, how do we make this environment uh, appealing for a woman that wants to go on maternity leave. So yeah. like things like this we can start to kind of do in the industry to encourage women more and more to join uh, industries that are male dominated. I've heard that a lot actually. In one of my internships, one of um, we had a mentor who she was telling stories about, she was actually in, well, in Baltimore, she was in Mexico, which I think that there is also a lot of, uh, they're, they're behind too when it comes to like, you know, diversity and some stuff, which sucks, but she was explaining that she fully did the interview. She was very qualified for the job, but then ended up not getting the position because she was young with the possibility of getting pregnant. And so what happens? And the, the people on the team explicitly mentioned that to her, that like, you know, you're a young woman, you're probably gonna wanna think about getting married soon. And she was like, but I just, I wanna get my career going. And it, it sucks, you know, it's scary for us to think about, well, am I gonna have to find a new job? Am I gonna have to figure out something else? Like if I wanna have a family? Yeah, unfortunately, that's like a huge factor when it comes like when when especially men are interviewing people for a job. It's like I've heard it a lot that yeah. that's what comes into their mind is the maternity leave, having to pay for the maternity leave and replacing them in the meantime. Yeah. And like so it, it is a huge factor that people always think of when you like you said, there's two equally uh, qualified candidates, yeah. which is not fair because these women need to provide for <laughs> these future babies. So they need to get the job. <laughs> Absolutely. That's yeah. a, I think it's a bit unfair for us, but I think we still have a long ways to go. And I think we are getting better in some ways and not. And I hear about it all the time that, you know, getting to getting a job now for us is maybe a lot easier, but going higher in that field is what still has a lot of barriers. And I hear it from a lot of different people. And it's obviously dependent on the company. If you have a really good company who supports the growth of women, it's, I think, really, really important. But sometimes, you know, when you have very big companies, it's like hard to be able to prioritize certain people or not, or smaller companies, which I know you said this was your first job, but any other experience in like a smaller, bigger company, have you had that type of experience? Uh, like experience, like- At a, like a small scale company versus a bigger scale company. Yeah, so I, I worked at Bombardier. I did an internship mm -hmm. at Bombardier. Um, and this, although we're a big company now, I think the Montreal facility is still like yeah. fairly small. Uh, but when it comes, if you're specifically asking about diversity, um, I, I think it's it's across the board. Whether yeah. you're at a small company or you're at a large company, you're still gonna see those same issues. Is it easier for my voice to be heard because it's a smaller company and try to make a difference? I think that's more reasonable and I think that's like more achievable yeah. or seems more achievable, you know, versus a big company. Uh, but I think the same issues with diversity are, are all over the place. I mean, I feel like that's why it's hard for us, you know, as going into the field to choose. Is it a big company better for us? Is it a small company better for us? I don't think we'll know until we experience both. So I also think internships are great opportunities to be able to, like, yeah. see everything. But, um, no, I feel like it's different, like you said, like, maybe in terms of the scale of things, but it ends up being the same on both sides. You know? Yeah, and I, I think um, when it comes to choosing your field outside of, um, like once you graduate, you know what I mean? Like always thinking about how best you're gonna get treated as a woman is, it might be hard, you know? And you need to do a lot of research to make sure that the company is willing and 
like willing to listen to you and willing to give you that opportunity. Um, but at the end of the day, like you have to do what's most interesting to you and what you're going to love. And if you have to push the ceiling and you have to um, like push your boundaries, like I'd encourage that fully, you know, you know, it's going to be worth it. If you exactly. really love it, yep. you're going to want to push. Totally. I just want to add one thing. Like, we always um, hold women accountable because they're representing. Like, that is something we need to not yes. think about or not have in our mind anymore. It is not our responsibility to prove anyone wrong, okay? Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, I, I, I want to say that to you guys because, you know, I, what you said earlier, like, I relate, I relate to that. I'm always you know, blaming myself and making myself feel bad about something that I did because it doesn't only affect me, it affects kind of like the stigma and the stereotype and all these things. But it's very important for you guys to let go of that or try to let go of that a little bit. And also when it comes to other women to not hold them accountable for that specific thing because it is not our responsibility to prove anyone wrong. And that's really important, honestly. It's well said. Yeah, very well said. That is like something that we have to think about in order to progress, in order to get more diversity and more quality in this field too, so. Yeah, totally. very important. It's adding so much pressure to you already when yeah. you're trying to <laughs> yeah. make your yeah. first step in the workforce, you know? <laughs> we're not even going into university and we're already thinking, oh, how am I gonna be treated in the yeah, workforce? Exactly, like exactly, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Anyways, moving on back towards uh, the, the biomedical industry in general, I wanted to know like how, uh, how it is within the company because a lot of people believe that you need to have a biomedical engineering degree in order to go into the field. Mm -hmm. So how would you, like how is the company formed? What kinds of engineers do you work with? And Yeah. yeah. Um, so, I mean, I think most of the people that we work with, at least in R&D, um, are either like mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, firmware engineers, software engineers, you know? Um, it's really cool to see, because even for me, I, I thought you 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 needed a biomed degree or something, you know, uh, that related to be able to work in these fields. But um, my eyes were com like totally open when I started working at this place, because um, you have opportunity in these, fields regardless of what engineering you did there's uh, room for industrial engineers there's room for supplier engineers there's there's room for everyone and I think it's really important to know that um, most companies have room for all different fields you know um, so it's really cool to see that as a mechanical engineer I can work like fully hands in, like hands-on in a med device company um, and I think it, it's circumstantial as well, um, depending on like what biomed um, job you, you're looking for. Uh, and if it's something that's related to um, like stints and, and technology integrating with the body, uh, then maybe, yeah, you should definitely look into that and see if that's something that you want to do. But um, don't just limit yourself thinking, oh, I want to work in med, so I have to do biomed. That's, that's not the mm -hmm. case. It, it's, like we're examples of that. To give you an idea, I don't think we have a single biomedical engineer at the company, <laughs> <laughs> at least in the Montreal site, right? Okay. And I think, honestly, it's we can blame the industry for that. We can blame companies like Boston Scientific for that because we, we, we have to kind of educate the students on this, right? Like, uh, a lot of people do think that for you to work at a medical company, you need to study biomedical engineering. But biomedical engineering is, let's say, specific to biocompatibility or anything to do with the human body, like Mel was saying, right? So... In fact, it's better not to be so specialized as a biomedical engineer to have more opportunities to work in mechanical, electrical, software, firmware, you know? So, yeah. Yeah, especially since, like, the biomedical engineering uh, field is, is new in schools. Like, not yeah. many schools offer this program. I think the only one is actually UDM and then McGill, McGill have a, yeah. like, some... It's a bit it's, different than actual yeah. biomedical, but there are masters to do it, but then 
people think, oh, do I have to do a master's now yeah. to work for this company? You know, we like, bonded over this. We were like, do we yeah, that's what this? we both like, thought. We're like, we have to do our mechanical degree and then do biomedical if we want to go into the biomedical field. Yeah. This is, I remember Frost had this whole conversation <laughs> one night. We were like, you want to do biomedical? How do we, how, what? Like, how do we and we're this? like, okay, we're going to be in school for a while, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> we want to do this. We're like, never mind. But yeah, so it is good for like, uh, the, like everyone who's watching to understand that because a lot of people are very interested in this industry. Like it's an absolutely fascinating industry in my opinion. And, but a lot of people are like stuck and like, I can't do this though. I don't have that degree or biomedical engineering, the programs that are offered oh here in God. Montreal, they're so hard to get into It's like because men. it's so limited. Yeah. yeah. So they're thinking, they have to think of it like in CJEP or beforehand, how can I get the grades to even apply to this program to hopefully get in and so the stress because <laughs> that's one thing that when I was like maybe if I don't do biology that I could do biomedical and it's like the perfect thing but then I was like okay I need like a 36 R score to get in straight out of CJ but I'm like that's exactly for like dentistry that's exactly for med it's ex it's, so it was like this is really hard to do and you know it's good to know that at least you don't need to necessarily do that. Even like software, you know, you have opportunities if that's other stuff like that. Software, electrical, all of that goes into like, especially with AFib, I'm sure there's a lot of everything with occurrence. I'm sure that's a huge part of it as well. So <laughs> totally. yeah. that's awesome. Um, I think if you know that biomed is something that you want to do, like totally go for it. But like I said, when I started engineering, I had no clue, you know, I had no clue what I wanted to go into. So definitely keep your options open and, and, and know that there's always going to be opportunity. If you're interested in something, you should totally go into it. And uh, there, there's opportunity in almost every field. I think you realize that more and more like throughout university. Like at first I was like, oh, I have to go specifically for a specific type of engineering firm. Like, you know, I used to want to do aerospace as well. And I'm like, okay, I could only work at an aerospace company and everything. Yeah. <laughs> but now I realize I could work at a business firm <laughs> in engineering. You know, it's like every company needs an engineer. Mm -hmm. So we really have like a bunch of opportunities as Which an engineer. Scary, so. though, knowing that you have so many options. <laughs> Too many like, options to how decide. Do you, how do you do this without knowing, you know? Which I feel like, and that's another thing, like how to get involved and in knowing if you like it is also another hard thing for students to do. Yeah, and, and I think it's so important to try and get internships um, or even like volunteer at companies if internships are too hard, you know. Um, but I worked at two different companies before I started working at this one. Um, and I did internships and, and that's kind of what helped me filter and pick this specific industry. Um, so I think it's really important to try your best to get work experience and see what the company companies are working on and 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 what makes you interested in engineering because there, like you said, there's so many options out there. You know, many. like, and I think the best way to narrow that down is to actually get the work experience and and try it and test it and see. Yeah, mm -hmm. even there's like so many roles within like one engineering job, like especially mechanical, like all four of us <laughs> were mechanical engineering students, you know, there's, the so, many <laughs> there's so many options because they literally, they try to teach you every discipline, even if it's in one class. Like, yeah, I know software technically. <laughs> I do. took one class about it, you know, <laughs> I think I could become one. No, <laughs> Ain't no way that I can become anything. But yeah, it's software. finding like different internship roles as well as like different types of companies, I think is very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you guys know that there was a lot of women in your uh, company before joining Boston Scientific? No? When I joined the startup, I was the first female engineer. Oh! So, wow. Wow. <laughs> so the answer is no. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, yeah, like uh, now Boston Scientific is a huge company, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, when, when we started as Criterion, the, the startup, we didn't have a lot of women. And I think even now our site has... Uh, more diversity than before, but still a lot of room for improvement. So the meetings weren't all women before, right? No, no, no. <laughs> and, and just to give you an idea, like um, our site is only R and D. So when we have those meetings, it's meeting with uh, individuals all over the globe, right? So some in in the states, some in Ireland, some in uh, Europe. So cool. when we talk Boston Scientific, right, it's like an international company. So these are the meetings I'm talking about, and I say, oh, that's nice. <laughs> that is impressive. 
Um, another question, I know you guys kind of uh, brought it up, but what advice would you give to engineering, engineers, like engineering students, sorry, who would like to pursue a career path in biomedical or just any advice you would have for them in general? So um, for me, I wanted to do aerospace, so I started mechanical, and at the time, there was no aerospace engineering at Concordia, right? So, but if I had the option, I would have done aerospace engineering. Um, now, thinking back, I think it's, it was kind of beneficial that they didn't have it because doing um, a degree like mechanical engineering gave me the option to work everywhere, like we were saying. Um, I think if you want to do a degree as specialized as biomedical engineering, um, just do your research and understand what jobs that offers. As Mel was saying, it's more like biocompatibility related, more customized, very niche, right? So knowing that, just uh, look more towards what you enjoy to study about, mechanical, electrical, software, more than, oh, I want to work in biomedical engineering because your engineering degree will allow you to get any job you want in any company you want. So that's the only advice that I would give, unless you're 100% sure, okay, I want to work for this company. Um, try to specialize in something a bit more broad. Good advice. And uh, I guess just to add to that, um, like take the pressure off a little. <laughs> I, I feel like um, we put a lot of pressure on ourselves when we're in university and I think I did that. I lost a lot of sleep. I, I made sure to graduate in four years and you know what I mean? <laughs> like like you, we put a lot of pressure on ourselves and I think university was one of the best times of my life so far. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I had a lot of fun in university. I think you should really enjoy it and and like um, network and meet people. I think th that those are like the most important skills that you can develop in university and it's really uh, meeting people and meeting different personalities and learning how to be compatible with different personalities. You know, we see that a lot uh, at the office. Everyone's different and, and you still need to collaborate and, and work with them. So um, like honing in on those soft skills are so important um, and university is the time for that, you know? So if I were to give younger me some advice, that would be it. <laughs> I think that's good advice in my opinion, at least. I feel like it's the pressure one specifically. I think it's yeah. everyone here, I'm sure, so deep because it's like, you know, starting university, you're like, can't take all these classes. I have to do super well. And then you're like, you do badly in a class. You're like, oh, my yeah. career is over. <laughs> like, I'm done. What am I going to do? And it's like, yeah. you know, you're not going to be good at everything. You're not, it doesn't mean you're going to be like not an engineer if you're not good at one class, you know? I think that's a lot of things that I wish I told myself at least at the beginning yeah. too. But even for us, I know it was hard for us because we started and it was COVID. So that was even worse <laughs> as an introduction to university. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, a lot more tough in its own way but then you know now that we've been kind of in person for the last two three years, years. Two, uh, three? Two. I don't even know timeline since COVID <laughs> it's, it's confusing for me but since we've been kind of back I feel like then our university life got a lot better it was a lot easier to interact with, you know meet friends do that like before that networking was super hard because you're at home and how yeah. do you network with everyone with a blank black screen totally yeah, <laughs> you know yeah, yeah. no but for example like that is very important because uh, like you said, like having a social environment around you too is like important and enjoying university. Like my first year of COVID was my worst grades and oh. I took less classes. I took a reduced course on top of it, but my first year was my worst grades. And then as soon as we came in person, I met, like I had a group of friends and, you know, we would study together, help each other out. And it, it was a lot more of a social event in a way. I, you know, I joined the society and like it all of a sudden brought my grades up. And like you said, I enjoyed university because of this, having this group around me, like a support group in a way too. Yeah. yeah. I think without that, it's tough. Like, I, cause she started a semester after I started. So I started in person for two months and shut right down. Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> I barely had a chance to even meet people in my classes. And at the time when I started university, I didn't know anyone in engineering. So my tactics are very much were like, okay, who's on the class list? How can I find them on some type of social media? How can I befriend them? and see if I can be like, hey, how can you want to work together in this class and try to do stuff? And that's literally how I ended up meeting my friend group now in university, that we all work together, we all help each other out. And I think that's, you're right, what makes it a lot better yeah. and <laughs> enjoyable. And then at least you have people to motivate and push you at the same time, which another big thing you have, you know, having mentors, having people around you that support what you do and like push you to do the best <laughs> you can, I think is 
incredibly important. Totally, and, and some of the closest people in my lives are people I met in university, you know? And, and to this day, they're the closest people in my life. So um, I think those are important things to remember as well, yeah. you know? Um, you, you meet some really great people in engineering and, and in university, and um, it takes you a long way. Like, uh, it was one of my, uh, like friends that told me about the opening at this position, you know, and like who would know that, like I would have never heard about it otherwise, you know? So I think those yeah. are important connections to have and to keep. Yep, no, I agree. I think that university's good and bad, I'm sure for some stuff, but like so far it's been good <laughs> when you have a good squad of people, you know, I think it makes it a bit, yeah. a bit more, a bit better in my opinion, at least. I remember being terrified, like going into my first semester, I texted my friend, I was like, I don't know anyone, <laughs> what am I going to do? It's also COVID, like I'm, I can't even go and ask teachers in person or anything. And then she gave me her number actually. So, yeah. so that was yeah. like, I, I met, was like, yeah. okay. I met her friend in Sijab and then I never met her because she went to Dawson, I went to Marinopolis, it was different worlds. Yeah. And she's like, can I give you her, your number? I was like, yeah, I'm like for sure. Like I don't know anybody in this program we're, either. We were just trying to make as many friends. <laughs> and that's how everything that's like, so cute. I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, through people you know at the end of the day yeah. too. And you know, I think it helps having a good support system. I say it all the time, you know, people coming in like meet people who want to have the same goals as you, you know? I think that makes it a lot more, you know, just motivating. Mm -hmm. Your environment's like, let's all do this. Let's all try to get as good as we can on an exam and then like let's all try to do this, like push each other and then you know, who gets what jobs? Oh, are you looking for opportunities I can ask, you know, you know, all of those things yeah. as well like it all kind of goes in a circle and ends up coming back and helping you out. So yeah, totally. I think yeah. it's a good thing. Yeah. Okay, so how would you say your university ex experience helped you help you become the engineer you are today? Um, <laughs> <laughs> very good question. <laughs> um, uh, I'd have to say uni more than like academics and, and my classes and stuff like that. Um, I think I, I learned how to be uh, resourceful. I think that was like the the biggest skill I, I honed uh, during my university days, and um, it, it's helped me so much in my career. Um, I'm I'm constantly collaborating with different uh, fields, so uh, electrical engineering, software engineering, firmware engineering, and sometimes to have a productive conversation, you need to be able to understand what they're working on a little to, to really be able to collaborate properly. Um, so I'm constantly teaching myself a little bit of electrical engineering, you know, trying to understand where they're coming from and where I'm coming from and how we can get to a middle ground, you know? Sorry. So uh, I definitely have to say it's about being uh, resourceful and, and being able to kind of uh, mold or melt, what, what is it? Like, like mm -hmm. uh, chameleon. What do chameleons do? Oh, uh, um, uh, camouflage with yeah, kind of thing. Yeah. Like, the, everything, but, you know? Exactly. To get along with everyone, basically. Right? Um, for me, like, the most important thing I did in my university years was joining um, SAE Arrow because it did teach you a lot. It did teach me a lot of those uh, soft skills that you don't get courses on. No one kind of gives you a course on how to write an email, for example, right? Yeah. <laughs> Only when I was the VP of Finance of SAE that I had to figure out, oh, I'm talking to industries. I'm not just talking to my you know, student uh, colleagues. I'm talking to Bombardier. I'm talking to all these big companies. And I have to kind of sell or sponsor, you know, get sponsors and all that. So joining these extracurricular activities, I think, are really, really important for your career. And if you have to get an A minus on a class instead of an A plus and be part of society and have a part time job at the same time as your education, I think that's much more worth it than getting a perfect GPA, in my opinion. So, this is where we're all in women in engineering, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That, has, <laughs> that has taught me a lot about writing emails as women in engineering. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I feel like I'm always reaching out to big companies and just trying to formulate the email very nicely. So, like, like you said, it really helps with the soft skills, just joining one of these. And I have to say, you write amazing emails. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. So it's, it's true. That's like the biggest compliment anyone can give. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I try. Yeah, honestly, I, I only really learned those skills when I started working, you know. Um, but uh, I think it's also important to um, 
like like I touched on it a little bit before, but um, being social and 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 networking and all those things. So even if you don't get an internship in engineering per se, even just having a part time job will teach you like like skills like time management and and prior prioritizing and things like that. Those are skills that you don't necessarily get until you start working, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's really great advice. And I think that whoever's listening to this will take that and try to hopefully, you know, <laughs> put that into the world and try to join and try to do other stuff. Like, again, also a good thing about us is we have a lot of events for networking, stuff like that. So I guess the good segue to kind of like end this episode a little bit where for us, at least for women engineering, we have a ton of events throughout the years, whether they're socials, whether they're, you know, actual networking events. And so for us, we have a lot of that and our social media has a lot more information on that. So um, firstly, this has been an amazing conversation. So we want to thank you guys both for being here. I know I learned a lot about, you know, the industry and, you know, being a woman in the industry and a lot of different stuff. So thank you both for being here. Um, and also thank you to the fourth space, of course. Uh, they have awesome events here too. They, literally every day they're always booked with stuff. So check out their Instagrams. They'll have a lot of information there. We also would like to thank our sponsor, Morgan Stanley, for their continuous contributions and their support for our mission. Um, us, again, at Women Engineering on all of our Instagrams, Facebook, LinkedIn, all of that. And also now all of our podcasts are now on Spotify. So if you want to listen to this, if you've missed some parts or want to hear our previous ones as well, they're all on Spotify. Um, the Iron Ring podcast by Women Engineering, I believe. Yeah. So, yeah, we'll see you next time. Thank you guys again. Thank you thank so you. much. This was a really great experience. I'm glad. Yeah, thank you so much. We're really honored to be here and help contribute to yeah. anything to encourage Ooh. women to, to, to join engineering. No, thank you guys, honestly. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> okay, yeah, thank you also to all of you for coming into Force Space today. Um, and everyone online, thank you all for attending there. Um, we're going to be closing up the Zoom and live stream now, but just a quick remember, this conversation is already available on our YouTube channel if you'd like to revisit that. I um, just want to tell everyone to have a great afternoon, and thank you very much. <laughs>